Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this seminar on equality, diversity and inclusion in research and innovation hosted by the Irish Research Council. Um, my name is Peter Brown. I'm director of the Irish Research Council. And for those of you who may be attending from, from outside Ireland, the mandate of the IRC is to fund excellent research across all disciplines and career stages, from, from archaeology to zoology, as we say. And we manage around 1,500 research awards, the majority of which are, are at the early career stage. And we're delighted to have uh, over 200 people registered to attend today. And we're looking forward to a really interesting conversation on EDI. And we've, we have a broad church uh, joining us today from across the research system, including researchers, academic staff, uh, senior leaders in EDI, working within our institutions, student representatives, colleagues from other research funders and more. So welcome to all. I want to give a, a particular, albeit Irish, uh, virtual welcome to Dr. Mark Richards of Imperial College um, and Blackett Lab family and also Dr. Joe Leary, head of, uh, head of EDI and UKRI to this seminar. And we would, we would have, of course, preferred to be welcoming you here and indeed everyone in person, uh, and hopefully it won't be too long before we'll be doing that again. Um, so we put, we put together this seminar as we publish an independent review of the Irish Research Council's Gender Strategy and Action Plan, the implementation of which actually commenced uh, back in 2014. And we will be hearing later from Ortis Economic Research and Loughborough uh, University, who in conjunction, uh, or sorry, in conjunction with Loughborough, Loughborough University carried out the, uh, the review. Um, gender equality has been a key focus for the IRC over recent years, and, and of course, for good reason. Uh, and it'll continue to be a key area of focus for, for us as there continues to be disparities in different disciplines and indeed across different career stages. But it's also, I think, clear that there's a broader EDI agenda. And indeed, this is recognized in, the, in our own strategic plan and in the review of our uh, gender strategy. This year is in fact the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the first research council in Ireland. And in that time, Irish society has changed pretty radically. We're now a much more diverse society, open to the world. The higher education and research ecosystem is also unrecognizable in comparison to the turn of the millennium with the establishment of technological universities across Ireland's regions. So a more diverse uh, society is here to stay with a multiplicity of different ethnicities, genders, orientations, cultures and religions, uh, to name a few. And our challenge as we move forward is to ensure that we're equally recognising uh, great ideas and contributions to excellent research, whether in academia or beyond, regardless of someone's background. And of course, in doing so, we'll maximize the collective intellectual capacity and innovative capacity indeed of Irish society uh, to address the challenges that we face nationally and globally. Um, and it's not only a, um, a challenge to ourselves, but it's an agenda on which the higher education research system can, can lead within society at large. Uh, and this is particularly important because we know that we have still some way to go to rid society of, of prejudice, sexism and racism. And we see that on a daily basis. Um, it's about leadership, but it's also about what's expected of us by others as a research innovation system. And by way of a case in point, I, was, I attended virtually um, uh, the opening of a R&D facility in Galway in this uh, Serenovus, who are part of Johnson & Johnson. It was, uh, the facility was opened by Minister Simon Harris. But what was interesting was um, in the speech by the global president of Serenovus, uh, Paul Mark Dickinson, the emphasis that he put on the diversity within the research and innovation workforce um, and the, the various initiatives that Serenovus are involved in to try and uh, facilitate that within their own workforce for business reasons and for other reasons. So the, the IRC is, is really delighted to host this seminar today. Um, and very shortly, I'll introduce our headline speaker, Dr. Mark Richards. We'll then move on to a short presentation from Andrew Graves of Ortis Economic Research, also from the UK, on the review of our outgoing um, gender strategy and action plan. And I'd also like to welcome Dr. Eugenie Hunsicker of Loughborough University, who's in our audience, along with Andy Rowell of Ortis. The last part of the seminar then is a, is a panel discussion, and we're delighted to have Dr. Gemma Irvine, Vice President for EDI in Maynooth University, uh, Dr. Joe O'Leary, 
uh, Head of Equality, Diversity, Inclusion in UKRI, and Dr. Ross Woods, Senior Manager in the Higher Education Authority Centre of Excellence in an EDI, uh, and join, joining Mark, um, Mark Richards uh, for our panel discussion. So we, we encourage attendees to pose questions. You can do so you, using the Q&A function on, on your screen. You may not see the, the question uh, popping up, but we will receive it. I would do our best to draw on, on as many questions as possible from our community of attendees today. And so to the, I suppose, the first item on our agenda to Dr. Mark Richards. Uh, Mark is an atmospheric physicist in the School of Natural Sciences in Imperial College London, which incidentally is ranked number three in the UK. Um, the school houses the Blackett Lab, um, named after the Nobel Prize winning physicist and global development champion Patrick Blackett. Mark is a senior uh, fellow in the school, an entrepreneur uh, and a DJ, I should add. He's also an activist, being a founder of the Blackett Lab family, which started out as a network to support um, uh, Black British men and women and other under, underrepresented ethnic minority groups in making careers in physics, whether in academia or industry or elsewhere. And Mark has spent much of his career working to enhance the participation uh, of under, upper underrepresented groups in all things physics. So delighted to have you with us today, Mark, and I'm now going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, I'd, I'd also like to, um, first of all, uh, say welcome to all, all the viewers and all, all, all the listeners. And thank you for the invite and for allowing me to share some of my experiences um, within I suppose the, the, the landscape of equalities, diversity and inclusion within science and academia. So I'm gonna try and uh, share my screen if it will allow me to. Um, so if you just give me one moment. Uh, hopefully, can everybody see that? You wanna yep, go into the full make screen? It. We're good to go, Mark. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the title of this short talk, uh, and then there'll be room for discussion, is uh, the Blackett Lab family. Uh, basically, we're just gonna examine the rationale, origins, and evolution. Um, as Peter mentioned, the building which I studied physics in as, as a PhD student, and which I teach in today, is called the Blackett Lab, and it was named after the uh, famous, uh, uh, notable Nobel Prize winning uh, nuclear physicist, um, Blackett. Um, but this, the Blackett Lab family uh, is something slightly different, so I'll explain that in a, in a bit more detail. Just to give you some way of background, Peter's done a very good job of giving an overview of myself, so I won't spend too much time on this, and he even mentioned the fact that I am a part-time DJ, uh, known as DJ Chemist, spelt with a K, just in case you want to check him out on SoundCloud. Uh, but you can see at the bottom here, it says, I, I, well, firstly, I've spent time in both industry and academia, um, as well as, um, as I said, um, done a lot of work around outreach and trying to encourage young people generally uh, into STEM and certainly into physics in particular uh, because of, of the benefits it brings uh, in terms of um, solving problems, obviously, and also in terms of uh, opportunities for social mobility and so on. And just to give you some context, uh, that is actually me in the Blackett Lab as a PhD student in the late 90s. Um, in, in terms, and then there was a question that kept reoccurring to myself, uh, which was, well, why are there not more people like me studying subjects like physics at places like Imperial? Um, and I tried to rationalize that myself. And perhaps I, I looked at my own uh, background. My parents came uh, to the UK from Jamaica in, in the mid 60s. Um, so they were probably you know, part of the so-called Windrush generation, if you like. And so I was a, a first generation here in the UK. And maybe uh, at the time I thought, well, maybe I'm just the first of a wave of, of physicists like me who are just, uh, uh, just uh, going to uh, sort of appear along the way you know, over time. Uh, but then when I returned as a postdoc, um, I realized that actually this, this just didn't happen. They, they just wasn't there. So I, I started trying to understand more. And I realized that part of the issue um, is, is it goes much further earlier in the pipeline, perhaps at schools. And that's what really got me more into, into outreach and encouraging young people uh, to, to consider uh, physics and, and STEM as a career more generally. And in fact, now that it, this is some recent data, and it may well have even been worse at the time when I was there, but in terms of um, black students enrolled on a, on a bachelor's physics degree program, it's about 1.6% in 2018. And on a PhD program, it's less than 1% uh, 
um, of all uh, physics uh, PhD students. So you can see that it's, it's quite, we're, we're, in terms of black students in the UK, at least, we're very underrepresented. And I wanted to try and A, understand what's behind this, and also, if, we, if possible, try and improve uh, that situation. And part of that is, for me, uh, it goes back to research and uh, you know and it's quite fitting that, that, that you know we are this is sort of being led by the, the irish research council because it is very much sometimes we are, you have to take a step back and think well what is research or at least what is research supposed to be and in many ways i put down some things that i've in my experience what research uh, it should be really it should be a body of knowledge and it should be a record of human endeavor um, and also a global collaborative effort um, of course, research should be interdisciplinary or can be, um, and a means of obviously solving problems, technical problems, societal problems, and also an instrument to inform policy. Um, so the policymakers, uh, they rely on research. Um, I'm sure over the last couple of years, how many times you may have heard we're following the science uh, for various policies that come out. So we want to, research is very much plays an integral role in informing the policymakers. So then if you ask the question, well, what is inclusive research? Um, effectively, it's the same things, except perhaps with an inclusive lens. So in other words, if you looked at those categories, let's say a body of knowledge and a record of human endeavor, um, there are some key questions uh, that might come out of it. I've used a, a few examples from physics, which I won't spend too much time on, but one of them is, is Satinia Nath Bose who is responsible for Bose-Einstein condensates and all sorts of things to do with Bose-Einstein statistics. But he was an Indian scientist around the turn of the century. Um, and he tried to get his work published in, in many, many of the leading journals at the time. And uh, they basically dismissed it simply because he wasn't recognized. And it was the, he actually sent a letter to Einstein who took the time to read it, realized he was onto something and they jointly published the work which led to all sorts of areas that I've just mentioned. So that's a potential where they could have been overlooked. Similarly with uh, Jocelyn Burnell, she was instrumental in discovering pulsars um, and it was deemed as one of the most significant discoveries of the 20th century in physics, but yet it was her supervisors who were awarded the Nobel Prize um, and Jocelyn Burnell was overlooked, presumably because the perception was that, you know, she was a woman in physics and um, for whatever reason, it was deemed that she wasn't as fitting even though she did the bulk of the work to actually discover pulsars. And then finally, I'll just mention someone more current, um, Jim Gates, he's one of the founding fathers of string theory, and uh, we don't need to know too much about what it is, but the, what he did, which was quite significant, he introduced something called Adinkra symbols, which was basically a way of representing mathematical operations, but rather than using, let's say, the traditional Greek and Roman symbols, he actually used Ghanaian Adinkra symbols, and that was, in his own words, to ensure that there was an African presence in that particular area of theoretical physics. Um, otherwise, he, he could effectively be erased over time and you wouldn't know that, uh, that there was that contribution. And the reason why I say this is because if we go back to those reasons or, or what research should be, you know, if we were to ask the question, are the great minds across the spectrum of humanity truly being harnessed? Well, that's where you'd have to wonder if they are, if they're all coming from generally the same demographic. Similarly, is our record of human endeavor an accurate reflection of its contributions? Uh, so we could use a Jocelyn Burnell example, whereby yes, human endeavor, we've discovered pulsars and so on, but was the contribution by that female scientist, was it, was it, an, was it recognized? In other words, is our reflection accurate? And then finally, does knowledge discovery carry equal weight wherever it's discovered? So in other words, I, I gave the example of Bose, um, but if I published a paper, maybe from Imperial College, I think we've mentioned they were third in the country, uh, it would probably be viewed uh, more favorably than maybe if I had transferred to, I don't know, the University of Ghana and decided to publish the exact same paper. Would it have the same weight? Uh, and, and of course it should do because it should be in the, the actual quality of the paper. But we know in reality, in the research sphere, that there, there, there are perceptions which can sometimes cloud um, how, we, how we view what is being conveyed. And we could continue in that similar way, but I'm actually going to skip the next part um, to talk more about the Blackett Lab family. So going back to why, uh, you know, when I, when I was a, an early career researcher, I noticed there was maybe one or two black students 
um, out of a cohort, maybe 250. And this was actually a meme at the time uh, on Facebook uh, because they were so rare. They were almost like unicorns. Um, and, and, but what I realized is that they were valuable to the, to the black community themselves. So when they graduated, I still kept in touch to allow them to support current students. And that's really what, what formed this, the, as we call, say, the Blackett Lab family. And we've grown and grown over the years uh, to, to a, a fairly sizable number where we meet two, three, four times a year get together with alumni and also current students, and they can share their experiences, share their you know, good practice, et cetera. And, and that helps to demystify that area of, of, uh, of, of if you like, the pipeline. Um, and also those students who are here, they can also support with outreach, especially when I'm engaging with, with let's say groups with, um, with a high, high demographic of, of black students, for example, I would go out my way to use those, un, those few undergraduates to support these programs because there's a symbolic importance of those students seeing someone very much closer in age to them um, at places like Imperial. The person circled is actually the tutor and all the rest were students, but you wouldn't tell that just by looking at the photo if you had to guess. And that's, that's really the point. So there is a, so I, I sort of made sure that we try to um, bridge that gap um, and again, since lockdown, we ironically were able to meet more regularly, albeit remotely, uh, and we were able to, to, to sort of formalize more. And that's what happened. So we created a website, the um, and also started getting much more active on social media and realized that we could actually um, coalesce students in other institutions, uh, black physicists in other institutions, so that they could actually uh, start to benefit from this cohort feel, and it also helps to increase sense of belonging. Uh, so we raise the visibility. One thing we realize is that within the community, we need to know that, that black physicists exist. Um, and so we'd raise the visibility and then and, and sort of have a little write up about them, for example. And we'd also, uh, we had an article in the Voice newspaper, which was Britain's biggest black newspaper, introducing the Blackett Lab family and the rationale behind it and why uh, we should do that. Um, and that, that shows that we're sort of trying to raise the, the visibility both from within and also from without, if you like. And just some basic stats so far, we've got well over 50 black physicists across the UK, uh, many Instagram followers, mainly from the UK. And we've also had uh, what we're called, um, oh, my lights have gone off, apologies. <laughs> um, We've also had, we've also had uh, what were called uh, root sessions, which was uh, reaching out through, reaching out through engineering and science. And these were discussions where we'd have discussion groups, um, uh, topics about all sorts of things to do with basically being a scientist, being from the black community, and re you know reconciling those things in different ways. I could read you some testimonies of, of some people who have engaged ranging from you know CEO of charities saying this is an excellent initiative uh, to maybe a year 13. Um, as you can see, Elsie said that, um, yeah, she, she'd never seen a black female physicist and it's something that she wanted to go into. So there is a symbolic importance of seeing yourself in the spaces you want to be in. And that's part of why we, we, we sort of um, embarked on this. And then similarly uh, from PhD students and right across the pi pipeline, we have um, black researchers, professors, etc., um, all members of the Blackett Lab family and all able to support at different stages of the pipeline. So I think that's a, a whistle stop um, tour through what's been happening with the Blackett Lab, Lab family. More, more recently, we've, we've signed a memorandum of understanding with the Institute of Physics, for example. We also work with the Ogden Trust, who fund physicists in various areas. And again, we've given uh, several talks um, to different institutions around this work. So my only real, real point here is that um, groups like this can really help to improve and increase sense of belonging uh, to the discipline and even to the institution. So those students, uh, the, let's say the original ones from Imperial, uh, they could have easily just graduated and drifted off into the ether. They would have all gone on to have good careers, I'm sure. Uh, but now they really do feel a sense of belonging to Imperial, uh, much more so than probably when they were there as an undergraduate, and also to the discipline. Um, they feel much more 
like a physicist, if you like, because they're seeing much more people like themselves in that space. And, and so the, the only final thing I'd say is that you can reach what I would say a critical mass um, um, through longevity. So if I had waited for this one or two per year to become, you know, 10 or 20 per year, we'd probably still be waiting. But the fact is, if I, you know, by, by keeping those few who pass through and sort of um, keeping them on board, we now have a very strong uh, cohort uh, moving forward who can assist in many different ways. And of course, those graduates have not all gone into professional physics careers. There are many different careers from law to, to finance to, to sorts of all sorts of other careers, as well as research, of course, and teaching. So that means now we have a rich pool of talented individuals who have a passion for physics and for helping to support and serve their community, uh, which can only benefit society uh, more widely. So I think I'll leave it there. I hope it's given lots of food for thought and uh, I'm quite happy to take questions in due course. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that was really interesting. Um, and your, your experience is obviously within physics, but I think it's applicable to so many disciplines Absolutely. of our research system, including the arts, humanities and social sciences. So I think, you know, huge lessons there. I suppose I'm struck, I'm struck by the importance of role models, um, you know, the importance of role models uh, to get you know, to, to, to actually enable um, people to feel confident going down a journey um, that they're unsure of um, and, and that kind of virtuous circle um, within that. And I mean, that's, that's kind of key. That seems to me to be, to be key to what the, the Blackett Lab family has achieved. Mm, absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, because I think, it, I suppose to draw an analogy, if you had to make your way across a room from one side to the other, and it was dark and there was furniture in the way, you'd probably move quite gingerly and quite carefully and quite cautiously. In fact, even if there was no furniture in the way, you probably still would move quite cautiously because you're not quite sure what's ahead. Um, but by, by sort of raising, by knowing people who have been through that journey, it's a bit like turning the lights on. Once you can see where the obstacles are, you can navigate it more freely. And so I think the role that the Blackett Lab family, it, it, a, demiss, it showed that, yes, it's possible to traverse that path, because often when you're from a marginalised group, not only are you often the only one, but sometimes we, we sort of delude ourselves into thinking we were the first ones, only to find out that there was others before you, but there's no connectivity between those who went before you and those who are here now. So I think, you know, forming a group like this really helps to demystify that if they can see people who have gone through that entire process and have gone on to successful careers, it then, uh, if you like, inspires them, reinvigorates them to, to tackle it with much less hesitancy than perhaps would have happened otherwise. Yeah. And I think what, what also strikes me from, from, from your comments, um, and it was something I was thinking about in the run-up to this seminar, is that internationalization, um, and of course, Imperial, I'm sure, is a hugely internationalized um, institution and internationalization absolutely contributes to diversity but it's not the same thing we no. also have to look at we have to look at homegrown diversity as well um, and yeah. would you agree um i i absolutely agree i think um in in, in many ways uh the black it lab family we i'm not saying that every single black physicist who has passed through the department over the last let's say 10 years, is a member of the Blackett Lab family. It's entirely up to them, it's their choice. But what I do find is that most of the ones who gravitate to a group like this are UK homegrown, if you like, because often they recognize some of the, the issues. Um, if you're coming from abroad, it's not to say you can't recognize the issue, but it's probably understandable why you might be less likely to get involved. One, because it's not specifically pertaining to you. You probably can go back to your home country. But if you're born in the, in the UK, let's say, and you're from, you, you know, if you're from a, a, a black or minority ethnic group or a marginalized group, then you're very much immersed in the issue. So you kind of get it much quicker. Um, and I think that's that's where the benefit of, of a group like this um, um, sort of is. We have a question here um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, from Helena um, Mahigo. I'm an IRC scholar, just finished my PhD and about to join industry. During my time in my PhD, myself and some of my colleagues started a conference to highlight the work of black researchers in STEM. Um, 
uh, across the island. What advice would you give us to grow this? Well, I, I think um, hopefully you, you can get to glean some of the uh, aspects from the talk, but certainly raising visibility uh, is key because there will be other black researchers in STEM, uh, but often they're embedded in some institution somewhere and you're not necessarily going to know. So somehow raising visibility, making yourself more visible uh, will attract um, like-minded people towards the group to strengthen it. So I'd certainly say that. And then obviously getting institution support. Now, at the time, I would say for most of the time, the Blackett Lab family was rather informal. Uh, but I would say at the very least, the, my institution um, at least didn't stop me from growing such a group. Um, but, but, but I would say if institutions can be supportive um, and, and, and enable those, let's say, champions um, to actually develop and, and, and enable them to develop the group, then I think that's much more effective than, let's say, if the department itself decided, right, we are going to create a group, uh, for example. Oh, are you still there? Yes, yes. Oh, right. Sorry, it's, it's my screen that's gone funny. I thought you jumped off. Yeah, no, so, so, clear. yeah so I think what it is, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, um, if you like, I know there's a lot of pressure, let's say, on institutions to diversify their intake, but often they think that uh, the emphasis must be on them themselves, the institution, to do all of that diversifying. But in reality, they've probably got champions within the institution already who have been doing some of that, and by supporting them, to enable them to do more will probably be more effective. So please bear that in mind, I'd say. Okay, I'm um, getting lots of, lo lots of questions coming in, Mark. I, um, so I'll try and fly through them. Sure. Um, can, you, can you offer any advice on how to approach the topic of making the curriculum more inclusive in terms of STEM subjects in, in higher education? Uh, yeah, <laughs> funnily enough, um, so We've, we've had discussions with this with the Institute of Physics, um, because obviously that's my area, but I'm sure it's applicable to many others. And um, let's say the IOP, they're, they're quite keen to sort of, as they say, diversify, decolonize, the, make the curriculum more inclusive. But if you just say to institutions, you must make your curriculum more inclusive, the chances are it's quite easy for the institutions or the particular discipline to say, well, we just don't have the, we don't have the, you know the material to be able to do that um so one of the things which we are doing with the iop um jess wade who's done a lot of work on on gender equality within physics uh, and has identified and covered many female scientists not just physics in stem as well who have contributed um, and i've done similar things on, on on you know with black scientists and so we're actually um we've, we've got a project starting in the summer where we're actually going to uh, create an archive because sometimes what happens is, it's one thing to say, well, this is, a, this is a female scientist or this is a black scientist, but what about the actual science? And so we're actually gonna look at the actual science they've done in the context, in, in this case, for a, for a physics degree, so that we can actually help institutions uh, show where they could embed the work of these people. Um, and so I think that's probably one of the best ways of, in, in my opinion, of, of, of doing that is that not just identifying scientists from underrepresented groups but actually trying to identify the science and how that could fit into the teaching uh, because then it's a more natural Im Im embedding rather than something that seems a bit con contrived or shoehorned in just simply to satisfy some sort of criteria I, I think the actual science can be embedded in different parts of the curriculum if we spend time knowing about the science as well as the scientist yeah that, that makes makes absolute sense um, just a couple of questions that I might take together. Um, have you seen, um, you know, have you, ha, has, has the work that you've done in the Blackett Lab family, have you seen it um, lead to institutional policy change within, for instance, within Imperial? And, also, and, and a somewhat related question, what, you know, what process did you undertake to garner institutional support? Okay, so, so two, two very good questions. Um, in terms of policy change, I'll say this, if you're looking for an overnight fix, it, it, that just doesn't happen. Um, this takes generational change. So, uh, and also you wouldn't necessarily be able to directly attribute the changes that you see today with what you did 10 years ago, necessarily you know, directly. Although you know, you probably get a good sense that you, you're making a difference. But in, in terms of, I mean, Imperial as an institution, they've made a commitment to, 
to increase the number of black students, um, you know, over the next five years and so on. And I'm not saying this is a direct result of this work, uh, but there is a recognition that, that uh, you know, an institution right in the centre of London, one of the most culturally diverse cities mm -hmm. in the world, probably, uh, that, that, that Imperial can do more um, to attract, you know, or at least to, to reflect their local environment. Um, but I suppose um, more, you know, in terms of hard numbers, um, when I first started, um, it was a bit like binary numbers in terms of numbers of black students. So one, zero, zero, one, you know, per cohort of 250. Uh, it's probably more like four or five per year, which may not seem like a huge difference, but it does make a difference over time. And especially for those one of you know, those few students who are there, seeing someone else like you in the same year uh, makes a difference. Also, if we look at A level take up amongst the black community, um, just over 10 to 15 years ago, there was only around 250 black students actually taking A-level physics. That number is now around 1,500. So there's a six-fold increase. Of course, we can't attribute it all to my efforts by any stretch. But nevertheless, I think that there is a cumulative effect over time. Um, and, and also, the changes you want, you want them to be sustainable. You don't necessarily want them, you know, for, for the year whilst the political weather is is fine, you know, it goes up. And then when, when the, the emphasis is taken off, it just disappears again. You want to make sustainable uh, long-term generational change. Um, but yeah, we've definitely seen changes. And I suppose the final thing I'd say, I do also sit on the Royal Society Diversity Committee, uh, quite instrumental in, in their report on ethnicity in STEM, which led to a round table discussion, which led to a parliamentary inquiry into ethnicity in STEM which the Blackett Lab family collectively sub made a submission to that inquiry. Um, so again, that's still a process ongoing, but if we didn't have this collective voice, which I think would be more powerful than one individual or one academic, um, then um, we probably wouldn't have been so influential. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're making a submission to a parliamentary inquiry, that's a, a great indicator of, of the influence on policy. That, absolutely. That, um, a very, uh, 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 a question about the, the great interest in the archive that you spoke about and, and the hope that yeah. that might be open access, so that might be... It will be. Well, yeah. just, just to, yeah, to emphasise, the, 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 the whole point of the archive was that when the IOP then start to push the institutions to become more inclusive in their teaching, and the institutions or some institutions might push back and say, we don't have any, well, they can actually say, we have an archive already, which you can explore and you can utilise. So the whole point is to make it widely available to institutions to help them become more inclusive. Um, so that's the basis of it. Okay. And a very direct question from Samantha Hallam here. Um, can black physicists from Ireland, and I, I joined the Blackett Lab and I realized- yeah, Of course, I absolutely. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and in fact, we have, we have physicists, you know, in the US as well who, who have joined and so on. Um, there's different ways in which you can get involved. We have, you know, we, from basic sort of social media, Instagram, uh, at Blackett Lab Fam, for example, Twitter and so on. Uh, there's a there's a private Facebook group which is, which is just Black physicists, um, which of course you can join. Um, and there's there's many different ways of getting involved. I think that the key thing is, uh, and in fact, in the US they have the National Society of Black Physicists, which have been going much longer, maybe 40 years or so, much bigger. And we've also collaborated with them, and and, and there will be like you know joint exchange programs and things of that nature, internships. So. Absolutely. The idea ultimately is to is, is to make any uh, physicist, um, you know, in this context, any black physicist from wherever they are, not feel as though they're a minority, but part of a global sort of family, so to speak. Great. OK. And one of the things we plan to do is, 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 to, is to put together some links and, and, a, and a miniature yeah. reading list and um, that we will send on to registrants for this uh, and we can include we can include those, those, those links in that. There's also a question about, um, uh, and I might finish there, um, I, and I think it might be something that we can discuss in the panel as well in terms of, um, you know, applying applying the the um, explaining applying your experiences and the lessons uh, to to the arts and humanities. Um, Absolutely. I, I, I don't know if you have any comment on that, Mark. <clears throat> well, um, I mean, well, first of all, I have a great appreciation for the arts and humanities. That's probably why I'm still a DJ when technically uh, I shouldn't be because it's too creative or something. But now in reality, um, I, I, I mean, uh, I have a little phrase really. So I talk about STEM and of course, 
in reality, in society, you need that creative input, the arts, so it becomes STEAM, uh, so to speak. And I'm sure you've heard STEAM as one of the acronyms. Um, but if you actually condense it all down, it all condenses down to ICE, which in my view is innovation, creativity, and enterprise. And those are the components which you need collectively as a society to really progress. So of course, whilst science and, and research might underpin innovation to some extent, um, it we wouldn't be able to achieve what we achieve without the creativity. And of course, we can't neglect the fact of enterprise um, mm. Uh, you know, to make it sustainable uh, long term. And so all those ingredients are, are needed to really tackle most issues in society. Uh, but the same principles that were applied within physics um, could be applied to any group. I suppose one of the key things is that you need, if you like, champions, a bit like myself, embedded in, in those disciplines, uh, who's going to be able to stick around long enough, endure it, shall we say, for long enough to, 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 for it to reach that critical mass. Um, to make it effective. Yeah, absolutely. I think ICE is, you know, something that um, really resonates with policymakers as well. Um, yeah. And also is reflective of foundational research and basic research. Um, so listen, I've gone over time, Mark, because oh, so many right. questions and really, the really inspiring and um, uh, really inspiring presentation from yourself. Um, and uh, we, we hope maybe we can Go into more maybe at a later stage we we can have have another i think have a have a more detailed presentation um or a more detailed seminar on on, on some of the some of the really you know the excellent lessons um uh, that have been learned so thank you again mark and i know you're going to stay on for the panel discussion but i'm under pressure now to uh, to move to andrew uh, so thank you again mark and um, i'll now move on to thank andrew you. graves uh from ortis who's going to present the findings of the review of the irish research council uh, gender strategy and action plan. Uh, Andrew, over to you and you, you may wish to share your screen. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, hopefully you can see that title screen there. Uh, can you see that, Peter? Yes. Yeah. OK, great. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation to present our findings at, at this event. Um, I want to thank colleagues at the IRC for uh, giving us the opportunity to do the research um, and for supporting us throughout, but also my colleagues internally. So that's Andy Rowler Ortis and uh, Dr. Eugenie Hunsicker and Dr. Gemma Whitcomb at Loughborough University. Um, I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes just talking through the main findings um, and uh, some of our recommendations. Um, the report is in the process of being uh, published uh, I on each screen I've uh, on each slide I've put a reference to the relevant section in the report. Obviously, there's a lot more detail in there, so I'd like you to refer you to that, please. Um, now then, there we go. So, um, just very briefly, uh, the overall aim of the study was to complete an expert review of the strategy and action plan, which were basically had come to the end of its sort of um, intended life uh, in around 2020, I think. So we began this process uh, just before that um, or around then. Um, and our objectives were to evaluate the success of the strategy and to identify outstanding issues and make recommendations as to how they might be uh, tackled moving forward. Uh, the methodology, fairly straightforward, four, four major elements, a literature review, analysis of secondary data, um, some surveys of researchers and reviewers, and then some focus groups. And I'd just like to also uh, pay tribute to the people who contributed to that, some of whom I know are um, participating in this event. So uh, without your input, you know, the study would have been um, uh, lacking in some of the key evidence we needed. So thank you. Um, the, the, uh, the, the study, uh, the review was in two major parts. The first was to look at uh, gender equality in IRC awards. And the second was to examine progress being made in integrating the sex or gender dimension in research. So my first couple of slides are about the former of those. Uh, and what we found when looking at gender equality across IRC uh, awards is that generally speaking, the portfolio is performing you know, very well in terms of catering for men and women. Um, 
The aggregated data across all of the IRC portfolio and awards uh, showed that there was really no disadvantage to women now, um, that since the strategy um, was published, there's been improvement in both the number of and proportion of applications uh, from women and also award rates. So the trends have very much been in the right direction. Um, but uh, what we also found was when you dig away into the portfolio a little more, there are some ongoing challenges. Uh, the first we found was that um, the, there has been a drop off in the proportion of applications from women in postdoctoral awards from about 50% in 2012 to 42% in 2019. Now, the, the survey and focus group evidence suggests that, that suggested that maternity was a big uh, influencer there. We'll come back to that, that theme later. And a second issue was uh, a separate uh, review of the Laureate Award, uh, which is a PI-led uh, later career stage award, found that the proportion of applications from women, de from women declined by career stage. So within the portfolio, there are some 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 issues which do need to be looked at in a bit more detail and targeted for for initiatives moving forward. Uh, we also found that the IRC performs well against comparator organisations such as the UKRI. Uh, for example, um, we had a look at um, some of the UKRI data and we found that IRC um, uh, actually delivers a greater parity in certainly in awards between men and women. So um, on that, you know, very kind of simple comparison, we thought that IRC was performing well. Uh, and lastly, uh, we found that the IRC is meeting its target for representation of women on assessment panels as a target of 40% set. And we found that the proportion had gone up from 37% in 2013 to 42 in 2019. And now what we also need to say is that there isn't uniform across the subject areas, however. Uh, so, for example, we found that panels uh, focused on physical sciences and engineering lag behind those in biomedical sciences and humanities and social sciences. So, again, within the portfolio, portfolio and within the work that's being done, there are uh, some uh, ongoing challenges. So in support of an analysis of the secondary data, we undertook our surveys and focus groups. And what we found uh, through those uh, research tasks and, and elements was that um, whilst there is an awareness uh, amongst researchers and reviewers of the strategy, that there is some room for improvement here. So we found that 50% of researchers and 40% of reviewers were unaware of the strategy. So uh, certainly um, further work could be done there. We also found that there's a slightly sort of patchy awareness of available training, um, so also an area for improvement. Generally speaking, there were positive views expressed on the progress being made in Ireland around gender equality. For example, survey respondents and focus group attendees spoke of you know, positive progress. They actually cited things which, which had uh, improved. But there's also a recognition, as one might expect, um, of some more intransigent issues and perhaps um, issues that were still uh, felt because it takes time for uh, initiatives to actually, um, for, for the benefits of initiatives to permeate down into the researcher and reviewer community. Um, so, for example, some of those outstanding issues identified were related to maternity and parental leave and pay, uh, which have, which, you know, were seen to have numerous direct and indirect effects around career breaks, caring responsibilities, imbalances in workloads, particularly around, for example, pastoral roles, which are seen to be sort of uh, disproportionately distributed, the precarity of research positions, expectations of research and mobility, and issues around around unconscious bias. So um, whilst there's definitely been progress, very positive progress made, uh, there are still issues to be addressed. Uh, respondents also talked about ongoing uh, gender imbalances, particularly in senior careers. I'm sure that's something that you're all, uh, you're, you're all very uh, familiar with, particularly in biomedical sciences and, and physical sciences and engineering. Um, so, so that was mentioned. 
Coming back to gender blinding, um, we found that respondents and focus group attendees were generally very supportive of the IRC's progress and understood that it was starting to uh, have a positive effect. Uh, so that was, we thought, very positive feedback. Um, however, we some respondents pointed out that um, it is quite challenging to completely eradicate indications of gender from application processes, which I know is something the ISC very much recognises. Um, for example, in later stage career, uh, because of the more extensive citations and so on and so forth. So uh, there are no ready-made solutions to that, but that's certainly something to, to continue to work on. Um, so some, just in summary, some of the areas for further improvement arising from the qualitative research included uh, targeting funding, particularly on underrepresented groups and by career stage, evolving the nature of uh, award assessments and structures, for example, to allow um, or provide more great, greater flexibility around career breaks and uh, lengthening funding calls and ensuring flexibility in research funding periods to make them more accessible to those returning from maternity leave or who take on caring, caring responsibilities, for example. Although it is really important to recognise that the IRC has made some excellent progress, uh, particularly with its policy around uh, parental and caring leave, which we'll come on to a little bit more, but hopefully you're all aware of that. We think that's an absolutely outstanding um, development. Okay, so the second uh, major focus was on the integration of the sex or gender dimension into research. Uh, so our first step within the study, within the review, was to review a large sample of applications and to examine the content within those applications over time in relation to the sex and gender dimension. And we found that there'd been an improvement in the awareness and consideration of the sex or gender dimension within research funding applications. So prior to the strategy, very few applications demonstrated an understanding of this and even less undertook to incorporate that understanding into their research. Um, but as a result of the strategy, the proportion of applications not providing a full response um, has decreased significantly. So, for example, in the uh, postdoctoral applications in humanities and social sciences, whereas before the strategy, one in four applications would ignore or, or provide no response to the questions around sex and gender dimension, that's now uh, one in 20. So there's been a significant decline in the, uh, in the amount of uh, sort of no responses, if you see what I mean. The evidence also suggests there's a tentative link between the recognition of sex and gender dimension in research applications and award rates. Um, so taking that into account is beginning to be recognized within the assessment process as, as a positive thing. It is tentative, but, but we did detect it. Um, we also think it's important, however, to recognize that uh, the growth in awareness of the sex and gender dimension is not uniform, and I guess nor would one expect it to be. So, for example, in physical sciences and engineering, the extent of a recognition lags behind biomedical sciences and humanities and social sciences. Uh, and looking forward, there's a degree of ongoing confusion within the research and review community that came out through our research regarding this. Um, so I don't think we can assume yet that the issue is completely resolved and therefore ongoing work to address this sort of ongoing confusion is needed. Um, a good example, I think, is that we found evidence that there is sometimes some confusion between gender inclusion, the sex and gender dimension in research and study ethics. Um, and therefore, I think some further work could be done to resolve that confusion. And whilst there's the, the levels of confusion is higher in, in uh, subject areas like physical sciences and engineering, there's actually also a bit more confusion than one, one might expect in humanities and social sciences. So, um, you know, again, I think that's just evidence of the need to continue um, with these um, initiatives. Um, we also think it's important to recognise that the sex and gender dimension is A, complex, and B, continually evolving. So again, this, uh, this is not an area where one can stand still, so that needs to be sort of baked into the forward strategy. 
So mainly, I think it's about uh, continuing to provide clarity, guidance and training attuned to different subject areas uh, in terms of moving forward. Um, and we think that this might be supported well by an advisory group, which, um, if it were multidisciplinary, could support the development of rollout of further initiatives and inject necessary expertise across different disciplines. So just a couple more slides. Um, yeah, the yeah. surveys. We're tight on we're tight on time. Yeah. Okay. The 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 Okay. The surveys and focus groups pretty much, I think, supported the, the findings from our quantitative analysis. Um, so I won't read through all of these things because we're tight for time. Um, there was some recognition of the value of the, re of the training that IRC is delivering, and I think that's very good. There's also some recognition that the pace of progress is different, different between universities and technical universities and um, institutes of technology. Okay, final slide, which is just about looking forward and recommendations. We thought that the, the previous strategy indicated a very welcome move from a sort of deficit model towards a diversity by design approach, and this should be very much encouraged. Um, obviously, further investment in the future to not only continue the good progress made, but also tackle perhaps some of the more intransigent or, or, or deeply seated issues, uh, and also some of the issues that we know are going to take time to resolve. So further investment is very important. A, a, a further evolution, which, you know, along the lines that we've seen in the last few years of the IRC offer is central to that, uh, based on this idea of diversity by design as a central theme. So that can include targeting awards, continuing to develop and build on the RSE's unique position within the research funding landscape in Ireland to you know, evolve that niche offer and to continue to adapt and, and, and innovate actually new, new approaches. And, and on that point, again, I just want to uh, you know, commend the IRC for launching their new uh, parental and caring leave policy last November. Uh, and then, really, there's a, a number of things around uh, good and, and uh, excellent practice, um, partnership working, uh, making allowances for career, career breaks, uh, extending funding call windows, and providing, excuse me, flexibility in research delivery periods, um, and continuing to develop and evolve the training and guidance that uh, sits alongside the sex and gender, and gender dimension. And then finally, you know, obviously it's important when implementing these sorts of strategies to continue to monitor progress and to evaluate um, how that progress is, is, is delivering impact. So thank you very much for listening. You probably feel like you've been machine gunned my information, I apologize for that. Um, but there is an awful lot in this review, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, and we're, we're very tight on time. So I think we, we maybe try and integrate the questions as we go along. Um, I know we had there was one question on um, whether um, confusion is, is with confusion on the sex gender dimension is with um, is with applicants um, assessors are both. Um, I mean, my 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 sense of it is it's, you know, particularly, you know, it's particularly a risk with applicants. Um, but, but there can be there can be there can be confusion all around. We we found confusion all around, but I think yes, but particularly applicants, but with reviewers as well. And I think there was also uh, evidence there of some resistance within the um, HE staff community to, uh, to 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 move forward on on this as well. So I think the answer is both, but it, but it's it's somewhat nuanced as well. I think. Yeah. Okay, well, we we're under, um, we're about ten minutes behind. So may I suggest we 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 we'll move on to the panel session, um, and then we can um, people we we can follow up on on any specific questions. And of course, the full report with all the data, and there's a huge amount of data which um, Andrew and colleagues have have prepared, and um, all the data is in the report, which is on our website. Um, and we will all. And there's also a question about making the slides available. We can do that as well. Um, so, Andrew, thank you very much for that presentation. And um, I should say, as, as director of the IRC, it's great to, to have um, the, you know, the positive feedback, I suppose, about the impact of the gender strategy and action plan. Um, 
Uh, and whilst there's a lot more to do, I think we're on the right track and good progress has been made. And um, so, so thanks again, Andrew. Um, now we move on to our um, panel discussion on progressing equality, diversity, and inclusion in the Irish research and innovation system. And I said, I'm delighted to have um, Gemma Irvine, who, who I should say was as deputy director of the IRC a number of years ago, back in pre-2014, um, had a, a major role in actually developing the gender strategy and action plan. Um, so Gemma, Joe O'Leary from UKRI, Ross Woods from the HEA, and Mark is joining us as well. Um, Gemma, I might come to you first. <coughs> um, um, we might still be um, spotlighting um, Andrew here, but uh, if we can go to gallery view, Connor. Um, but uh, if I could go to you first, um, Gemma, maybe if you could talk a little bit about some of the initiatives Maynooth University uh, is taking on, on EDI with particular reference to research and innovation. Gemma, are you with us? Thanks, Peter. Um, happy to speak to the Maynooth University situation. Obviously, can you hear me? Very, very. It's very. Your bandwidth sounds like it's gone quite, quite poor. And um, Gemma, maybe I'll come back Hello? to you. Can you hear me? Peter? That's a bit better. Yeah, that's a bit better. You were you you were breaking up to get in with, but uh, that, that's a bit better now, Gemma. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're having a low bandwidth problem with Gemma. I might uh, I might move on. I might move on to Joe and see. Hopefully, um, hopefully, uh, Gemma's bandwidth will improve. Joe. Um, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, UKRI obviously have just in recent weeks um, put out their draft uh, EDI strategy for consultation. Um, I suppose I'm interested in, and, and it's, it's quite wide ranging and multifaceted, and I, I'd, it'd be just great to have, a, I suppose, an overview of the, the key pillars of the strategy and the key principles. Sure. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I think we've... Um just launched consultation on our draft EDI strategy and this is the first whole organisation strategy for UK research and innovation. Uh, the strategy builds on a lot of previous work that has been conducted both in UKRI and in the councils before that and we framed the strategy around the three major roles that we consider UKRI has. So firstly as a leader in the research and innovation system, and then secondly, in our role as an investor and partner, and thirdly, our role as an employer. And so what we've set out to do is create a framework for the creation of action plans across the whole organization for UKRI. And within the strategy document, we've highlighted some areas of work that we think are priorities for us and commitments that we're setting out. So, um, some of those relate to the UK government's people and culture strategy, which is aimed at creating a more diverse and inclusive research and innovation system, thinking about the incentives that UKRI has and, and the rewards and recognitions and the, the hard levers that we have to make change. We're also really interested in how we use our investments to drive inclusion. So whether that's through procurement, for example, through the grant funding that we deliver, through investments in, in EDI research itself. And then also in our role as an employer, creating inclusive leadership and management within the organization, improving the diversity of our workforce and the diversity of our decision making bodies. The fourth arm of our strategy is about um, data and, and evaluation and really understanding the impact of the changes that, that we make and really thinking about that from a whole sector perspective. So we're really keen to work in partnership um, and it's been great to hear today um, the, the review of, of the gender strategy for the Irish Research Council and I'm sure that there are things we can learn um, from, from that. And so the consultation is open until the 28th of March, and we'd really like to invite all of you to participate in that consultation. And then we'll be using that to create, help us create our action plans and then take forward our partnership working to really drive system-wide change in, in research and innovation. Okay, thanks, um, thanks, Joe. I mean, what would be, 
what would be kind of your your advice to Ireland in the context of developing a national EDI strategy for research and innovation? I think from our perspective, we're really interested in system-wide change, um, sustainable long-term transformation. Um, and I think that's the importance of really recognize how, recognizing how we work in partnership. So a single body cannot hold all of the, the levers and drivers to create change. So how do we work together? How do we do that efficiently and effectively? How do we learn from each other? And perhaps also, how do we how do we learn from things that don't go quite so well? So we shouldn't be afraid to experiment and pilot. Um, and I think it's a really great opportunity for us to really advance um, inclusion as uh, together. Thanks, Joe. I, um, I might move on to Ross. Um, Ross, uh, looping back, I think looping back to to um, the the issue of of um, ethnic minorities. I know the. The HEA did some really interesting work before Christmas on uh, on racial equality in higher education and research, and it'd be good to just get a kind of a very brief synopsis uh, from you as uh, on, I suppose, the key findings from that study. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, yeah, we ran um, a survey. I suppose it was the end of um, end of twenty twenty, start of twenty twenty one of, of um, basically asking staff in her education institutions about race equality. And we found some really interesting, we had got some really interesting findings. This was with about a 10% response rate of the overall population. Um, and it was interesting to see that the response rate when we broke it down by um, ethnicity, it was about a 90% uh, white respondents and 10% from minority ethnic groups, which is um, pretty much reflective of the actual uh, general population um, based on CSO data. But what was actually, what was actually um, interesting, this was just in terms of demographics of, of um, staff in higher education institutions, is that 80% of, um, of the respondents were, were white Irish, but the 10% um, additional were, um, were international. So there's a, there's a nuance there as well between staff who are, who are non-Irish, but also staff who are from minority ethnic groups. But really what we found was that those staff from minority ethnic groups, um, the responses that we had from them to the surveys just really reinforced what we thought we knew anecdotally, was that they had less opportunities and, and worse outcomes than, than, um, than white staff in institutions, very much reflecting other work that we've done in the area of gender equality. And I suppose, um, the real impact of that report would be what comes in the recommendations and we're currently working um, to, develop, to develop a plan, an implementation plan around those recommendations. And I suppose what we're trying to do is work with the sector to ensure that this work, that there are two features to this work, that really they, it has impact in terms of race equality. So that it actually does something with race equality, but also that it leverages the work that we're already doing um, on gender equality. And I suppose it's interesting to see in the in the review um, published by Andrew and colleagues today of, of um, the IRC strategy that there's a there's a, a, a recommendation to move into kind of broader um, EDI and so on and. and this is one of the things that we're seeing as we as we do that at a national level in terms of um, HEOs is, is uh, it's really how to kind of maintain the focus on, on gender inequalities, but to ensure that when we bring in additional um, areas of EDI that we want to focus on, that we give them their due as well, so that we don't we don't simply tack them on the gender inequality. So it's, it's quite interesting, and I mean the main recommendations are around um, training. Uh, I suppose what would be of interest in a research context would be the recruitment of panel members and so on, that they get um, race equality training on top of the, the kind of gender focused training that they're already get, getting. Uh, I mean, anti racism training for staff. Um, again, something that feeds into, I suppose, re um, research as well will be around uh, targeted advertising towards ethnic minority groups. And I guess that builds on, you know, everything Mark has been saying about, um, about trying to attract um, more diversity in the research and particularly into those areas where we see um, a, lack, a lack of uh, diversity. And this was a finish on 
Um, one of the strongest recommendations, which is something that we already knew, and it's around data collection. And we noticed in the Q and A, there was a question where someone had asked um, at the very start of, of Mark's presentation around statistics and around on subjects of study by race group. Um, we actually, we are, even though we collect gender data, we have done for a number of years, we, we have very little data at the level of subject. Um, because the HEA doesn't collect that systematically. And actually, we have there is an absolute dearth of data on staff ethnicity in Ireland. So it's something that on the back of the, the report last year that we really want to work on and work with the sector on to try and get that, that data. Um, you know, when we repress that, uh, a lot of institutions don't collect it. And I mean, the research funders are well placed in their data collection in terms of when applicants are coming in to, to collect that as well. So, so data is really a, a big thing. And as we know, policy nowadays is all evidence-based. So the more data, the more evidence we can get and we can start addressing issues in, in certain areas. Thanks, Ross. And uh, yeah, I think I think you made your point is well made about data. And I think it, it probably it cuts across higher education and research and 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 you know, and both jurisdictions, you know, Ireland and indeed, I'm sure the, the UK. I might come back to Gemma. I'm hoping that Gemma, um, that Gemma's bandwidth has um, has improved. Um, I see you've gone off mute, Gemma, which is good for starters. But maybe um, you could talk a little bit about, um, I suppose, about what you're doing at local level in Maynooth and Gemma in relation to EDI, with particular reference to research and innovation. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me? Yeah, that sounds great, Gemma. Great, thanks. Apologies for the broadband issues. Yeah, at a local level, we've got appointed vice presidents for equality and diversity in each of the institutions, and that's really um, had a huge impact in being able to bring gender equality and then it broadened out into EDI across every area of the universities. So I would work with governance, with research, with enhancement of teaching and learning, with access, with our systems and our policies. And I think that's really um, enabled us to, to move things in Ireland because we're working on that multi-level approach. One of the things that I think is really important is bringing men into the conversation. And we've had a lot of um, focus on this, and I'm delighted in this pa uh, panel in particular to see so many men, because that moved it from being a fix the women issue to being a societal or fix the organization issue. And so our focus at a local level is also about bringing the tools that we've got, like the Athena Swan framework, like our quality assurance um, for teaching and learning, and being able to um, put equality, diversity, and inclusion in all of them. So what we'd actually like to move towards is a, a um, an EDI assurance process where every four to five years we would do similar to a quality assurance where we'd check in on our people and our culture and see if there's things that need changed, see what worked well, and then develop actions if we need to address um, certain things. And it's all about that participation and belonging but also recognizing talent. Ireland is becoming more diverse in our population. If we're not seeing those percentages moving through the school system, into tertiary education, and then into the workforce, and ideally up into professor level and higher education, there's a problem there because talent and genius is equally distributed across gender, race, class, disability, but opportunity and access are not. And so that's where the focus at local level has really been educating ourselves so that we can identify issues and then making sure that they don't influence um, our decisions or um, have an impact. And I know you're tight on time. So one final thing to say as well is equality and inclusion of practices. It goes back to the point made by Mark about being sustainable. This isn't gonna stop. When you're aware that there's biases and you have to work around them, that's something you have to do every day. And that's why the IRC looking at your policies and your practices is essential. They're really our safety net to ensure that we don't get complacent. This isn't an end goal. This is gonna be a lived experience or a practice of equality and inclusion. Mm. Thank you, uh, Jenna. And uh, yeah, I think those, those are really interesting points um, that, that you're making um, about you know how things should be reflected at, at local level. Um, Mark, I might, and in fact, um, I might ask a couple of panel members about this. And this, I suppose, I wanted to ask a, a question, Mark, about systemic 
um, systemic issues um, that mitigate against equality, diversity and inclusion. And the, o the OECD have a really good report about precarity in academic careers, which of course is multifaceted. But one recurring theme is the point at which competition goes from healthy, you know, which promotes excellence to unhealthy. Um, and, and many believe that this promotes poor culture. The term academic inbreeding has been used and that bullying and harassment is more likely. Um, and I think the another key issue is that the, you know, the basis of assessment for researchers is too narrow and this, that, that this can mitigate against EDI as well. I'd, I'd, just, I'd, I'd welcome your perspective on this, Mark, in terms of that, what you know, might be seen as wider systemic or structural issues and how, you know, how addressing them might promote better EDI. And I might, I might come to Joe on this point afterwards. Yeah, I mean, um, I think when we use terms like systemic racism and systemic bias and so on, it, it, it's almost an emotive term. But nevertheless, um, if this was, let's say we had an experiment where we were expecting a result, I don't know, temperature and resistance, and we were expecting a result for every, every single difference, and that result was always different to what we were expecting, but it was always different in one direction, we would know if you're an experimentalist, that's an experimental bias. There must be some systematic bias in your experimental setup that is causing your data always to be out. So, for example, with the Royal Society, we looked at um, the attainment gap, you know, those are the percentage you get first and two ones. Uh, at that point, it was between, it was uh, for BAME, they said BAME, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic, and white students. And there was this consistent 10%, roughly, gap over a 10 to 12 year period. And it was consistently um, roughly about 80 plus percent of white students get a two, one or a first and about just below 70 uh, of others. So that in itself, the data seems to demonstrate there is a systemic bias. Um, and I would say, if you're gonna, if we're gonna use terms like that, make sure it's backed by what the data says rather than what an opinion is. So the first thing is, yep, there's a there's a bias. But then the next question is, well, yeah, how do we how do we mitigate uh, against that? How do you correct for that? And that's where it depends on, you know, that that's where you have to sort of rely on policy in terms of addressing uh, uh, the bias. But but I think some people don't get over the fact that you 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 state that there is a bias and they think it's a, it's an opinion. That you have for personal reasons or anything like that but if the data supports that then i think that that gives you the gravitas to then ask serious questions about how we're going to address it in terms of what could be the causes of course the data could highlight that there's a there's a difference but it doesn't necessarily tell you what's behind the difference or what the causes are and that in itself could be multifaceted um we know that you know certainly within academia i mean i sometimes take a step back and if i was to be frank Academia, as we know it, essentially for many years, probably centuries, was effectively the pursuit of the white middle classes. So therefore, it's not surprising that if you're from that demographic, you're probably going to be perceived as more of a scientist than maybe if you're from outside of that demographic, um, specifically white male middle classes, if truth be known. So if you're from outside of those those demographics and different people are in different ways, then there's always a, a, a barrier, an extra barrier, if you like, that has to be overcome. So in my mind, I think that we probably want, in an ideal world, you want to take a step back and have a real look at this system that, that, that sort of came from that pursuit, but now we're trying to make it fit in the 21st century, uh, a diverse global community. We're, we we're taking those same, many of those same yardsticks that we use and making it fit in a diverse 21st century uh, world. Uh, and there's no, no wonder why it, it's not quite a, a good match. Um, and so I think that, that there has to be, we have to relook at this so-called pipeline uh, if we, you know, and see where we can actually make it more fit for purpose in the 21st century. But you're right, because otherwise like attracts like, if you like. So, um, you know, there's many examples along the career pipeline in terms of research, where you know um, people who lead a research team often see a young you know their young selves in in these in, in the new researchers they don't necessarily um, and also in terms of you know things like adverts for jobs it might be things which might seem 
um, sort of nondescript at the time, but, it, but can exclude many people. So, for example, if there's a high profile job uh, at, a, at, a, at an elite institution um, in the UK, let's say in England, they might say must have extensive knowledge of the UK research environment. Well, straight away, you've probably ruled out many, many international applicants straight away. Um, and they'll, they'll go further. So we've got to look at, you know, how, you know, are we really trying to in attract an inclusive applicant pool? Uh, because sometimes it's almost engineered in such a way that the applicant pool becomes exactly sort of the same as what's been before. And then when you ask, well, why is it not like diverse? It's quite easy to hide behind. Well, um, we're just not getting the applications. So I think there's, there's, there's this, this virtuous circle, which I believe academia have, have managed to sort of hide behind for many, many years. Um, and I think that if we're really serious about diversifying the pool, which after all, will benefit all of society, as, as, as someone said earlier, you know, intelligence is distributed uniformly amongst all demographics. So we're clearly not getting the best out of society at large if we only have a tailored demographic um, sort of in that space. So, so I, I just think that if, if we were to try and make it more diverse and, and fit for, for all, then we've got to take a look and say, well, that's where it started from. If you go back to, I don't know, 19th century science, for example, it was mainly the pursuit of white male middle classes. Mm -hmm. Now we're in the 21st century. Why would we think it just suddenly changes unless we change it? Mm. Thanks, Mark. And um, Joe, I might come to you, um, you know, in terms of the, the basis of assessment, um, you know, the, the, the emphasis that's put, you know, the base on which researchers are assessed on the basis on which their, their careers progress. And do you see a link between, you know, be, between, you know, the traditional relatively narrow basis uh, um, for, of assessment, uh, you know, and then challenges for EDI? And is that something that, that UKRI uh, want to, you know, want to look at in the context of their emerging strategy? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think we, if we think about the whole of the research and innovation system, then we're looking not just at traditional academic career paths, but mobility and porosity within the system. So how do you move in and out of academia? What does that look like? How do you how do we measure and value different successes? How do we assess those things? I think these things are really important. Um, uh, one of the things that UKRI is doing at the moment is rolling out narrative CVs so that people can describe their experiences in different ways. Um, and we're working with other funders to, to do that. And I think that's a really important step. So what do we value? What do we recognize and reward? How does that lead through into the assessment processes? But I think that's a question not just for research funders, but also within selection and promotion criteria within institutions as well. So I think there's, I think going back to Mark's point, this is really about kind of understanding the, the system wide issues and really um, using our data, whether that's qualitative or quantitative data, to really explore what the root causes of issues are and not just trying to address symptoms. Thanks, Joe. Um, Ross, I might come to you on, on Athena Swan, and I always had a, an interesting um, uh, catch up with Sarah, who I, Sarah Fink, acting head of. Um, Athena Swan in Ireland, who I know is, is attending today, um, but just in terms of the potential for Athena Swan um, to, to, to help with the EDI agenda going forward. Yeah, that's a good question here. And um, it's interesting because la, la, just, um, just last year, late last year, um, Advance HV published um, new Athena Swan Charter principles. So well, Athena Swan is, is very much, this was a gender equality charter in the UK. We've worked very hard in the last um, five years or so to adapt the Athena Swan much more clearly to the needs of the Irish higher education system and, and the research system to try and um, focus it more broadly on the EDI issues that are of concern to the staff across the system. And I guess that, that really what we're looking at now is a charter which retains the, the primary goal of advancing gender equality, but which is now trying to take a much more intersectional approach, which is what our institutions are trying to do anyway. So, so we're trying to position it like, like that. I mean, and, and you'll know this yourself, Peter, I mean, ultimately the linking of the a strong accreditation to research funding and eligibility I think has been the single greatest driver of 
gender equality and the implementation of gender equality plans across British higher education. So, so I think that that remains, um, you know, the key piece of piece of work that we've done, and that, that we're going to need to keep that emphasis of of um, you know institutions needing to work on the, on these areas because it's. And, and it's it's really a kind of it's a circle really because it goes back to Gemma's point and Mark's point about diversity helps everyone, and um, mm. but sometimes there needs to be some carrots and some sticks to ensure that that happens. And I think that what we've done here in Ireland has worked worked very well in that regard. Thanks, and um, Gemma, I might come to you. Um, I, I'd be interested in, in your uh, your perspective on you know what what you would like to see. Um, what you would like to see from the next national research and innovation strategy in relation to EDI? Would that be, you know, particular, you know, particular um, things you would like you would like to see in the context of the new strategy, which of course is is due, I think, this year. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, it is due this year, and it would be interesting to see. Um, what is in it, but I think the recognition and obviously from um, the UK RI EDI focus, it has to be about people and talent um, and the change. I think it's a really good point um, that Mark's making about the system was built back in historical times when it was appropriate to use the measures um, that we've been using, but across the board, we're realizing that that needs to be looked at. So I think for an Irish system, that recognition uh, of educating people in the system who have been looking at cookie cutter teams or research um, development and enabling them to effectively take the blinkers off, that's what all of us need to do, to be able to see where there are potential uh, for bias and there's many different types of bias so that we can enable that diversity to bloom. It's there. There are excellent people in our system right now. And actually, um, one of the things that I think would be great for our research system is to have a look at the refugee and asylum seeker um, system that we've got, because we have talented people with multiple masters, with PhDs, who are not uh, allowed to work because either that's not recognized and they're having to go back to a level three education. So we're not supporting people to reach their full potential but we're not recognizing talent when it's on our doorstep and I think in the you know competitive nature that is research and innovation that just seems uh, ludicrous so I would like for Ireland to really you know build on the strong platform that we have our government yourselves as agencies the institutions have been fantastic in this multi-level approach that we've adopted it's um got recognition internationally in america they use us as a case study for how to shift the dial on looking at um diversity and inclusion so that now needs to go into our research into our international education into our other department focuses as well this is a really good um example of where everybody works together across different de uh, departments for people talent uh, and culture we can get change so we'll see but absolutely it would be great if our research strategy had uh, uh, explicit statements along those lines yeah thanks um thanks Gemma. and and i did, again the, the comments and, and questions are continuing to um to come through and um, there's a comment i think about you know um you know in terms of gender equality um be, be, between pis um you know is it truly is it truly equal or you know we, we need to look at we need to look at the the lead pi we need to look at members of teams and whether you know whether there's actually gender equality um, and I'm, I'm sure it varies you know varies by discipline data collection has been mentioned as a huge issue um and i think we i think we all agree with that um uh, how can funders do a better job of communicating to referees and panelists about what they're looking for in terms of excellence? So it's not always judged according to the same narrow definitions as it has been traditionally. And I think that's that's a job of work for for all the research funders. Um, uh, and then various uh, there's a there's some fairly long comments which I won't read out verbatim. Um, government are currently preparing an equality data strategy to address the this, this significant gaps in uh, data gaps in Ireland. Um, 
and and asking you know asking that the HEA and a, uh, the, the HEA and IRC have input into this uh, this this process. Uh, strongly support Ross's comment linking Athena Swan with HEI engagement. So lots lots of um, interesting discussions and, and conversations springing up. I might um we, we're running out of time. Um I think we've literally only you know very much tip of the iceberg stuff, and and I think I think there's certainly more conversations to be had. Um, I might finish finish off um, with you, Mark, and, and uh, I suppose I wanted to ask about the pandemic and, and if you see that as having, you know, that, that kind of highly disruptive event, um, you know, does that have a particularly negative impact on EDI uh, or, or is it, you know, or, or is it not so, so, so prevalent? And, and is it something that we then have to redouble our efforts to, to build back better from? Or is it something that we can kind of absorb and maintain uh, the level of EDI? Um, I think, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think in some ways it's still too early to tell what the, 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 the long-term impact of the, of the pandemic is in terms of EDI. On some things, um, I suppose it, it, it has had a, a disadvantage, especially for some for students, for example, who have to a lot of matter work from home, or, you know, et cetera, like most people. Um, and, and, and it's about the environment. If you're in a, a well-resourced environment at home, um, and, and then, then you're, you're, you're more likely to perform at your best than if you're maybe somewhere in cramped conditions and so on. And none of that was really taken into account. At the end of the day, they all had to do exams remotely, et cetera. And they're, they're not judged on what their actual personal home circumstances are. And, and, and many people from marginalized groups, um, they, they, they are, you know, they often have, you know, have financial challenges um, and home circumstances that, that, that might not necessarily be the norm. Uh, so there is that aspect. Um, but, but at the same time, I think, as I said, with the Blackett Lab family, we had been sort of unofficially going for, you know, 10, 12 years, meeting two or three times a year in person and so on. Uh, but when the pandemic happened, we were able to become much more organized and formalized. So in a way, it can provide an opportunity to connect much more broadly because you kind of had to reach out. So I think it, it depends on, I mean, it's a bit, as I said, it's too early to say, uh, but I can certainly see how there are some immediate disadvantages. Um, but I always like to keep an optimistic view to say, well, actually it opened a window, it can open windows of opportunity, uh, which perhaps weren't quite as, as, as prevalent before. Um, and, and in fact, I, very briefly, I was, I was a, I'm a PI of a project uh, called Strengthening Learning Communities, which is more on physics education research. And this project was agreed or approved before the pandemic. And one of it was around sense of belonging. And part of the, if you like, our, our concern then was for those students who had to live at home and maybe commute in uh, to, 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 to university and how that affects their sense of belonging to the, the university environment. Uh, but then after the pandemic, everybody was, was sort of working away from the campus. So sense of belonging became much more broader. Um, so, so again, I think the pandemic has, has changed the landscape in many ways, but it's also made us slightly more aware of what is potentially possible, um, you know, in a, a more optimistic way. So I, I wouldn't say that, I, I couldn't say definitively, it definitely has affected. I think it's, it's, it's potentially can, but I also think it can also, it could have provided opportunities that would have been unforeseen or, or accelerated um, those, those opportunities much more quickly which we may well benefit from in the long run. So uh, jury's out, I'm afraid, on that one. No, I, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think you're right. And, and um, you know, I think it reflects probably the way we see research innovation coming out of the pan pandemic more broadly. It's created challenges, but it's also led to new opportunities. And maybe on that note, I need to draw things to a close. So first of all, I want to say to, to Mark, thank you for, as our headline speaker, thank you for, um, for participating today and sharing your, your, your experience and knowledge um, uh, of the work that you've been doing in the UK on increasing, um, increasing diversity and in research innovation. So thank you, Mark, and great interest, I think, in the work of the, uh, among some of the physics researchers who were on this call, particular interest in the, in the Blackett Lab family. And I think there, there, there could be some, I think we should keep that, that conversation going and seeing how, how we could make connections there. So thank, thank you, Mark. Um, thank you to our panel. Um, Gemma Irvine, Joe Leary, uh, Ross, uh, and Ross Woods from the HEA. And indeed, thank you, Andrew, for your presentation on the findings of our, of our gender strategy. I want to also um, particularly thank Connor 
I don't know if you can put your camera on, Connor. Connor Linney from my colleague in the IRC, uh, who's just been a, a huge help in putting this seminar together. Thank you, Connor. And also Connor and Emer have have been hugely involved. Emer Cahill have been hugely involved in the in putting together the, the report that we're launching today. So uh, and then and so that's that's really all. And then thank you to uh, all the attendees um, uh, and a very very rich conversation. Judging by the questions that were coming in, um, and all that remains for me to to say is thank you and have a a great day. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.